In another land and another time, an Albanian Catholic monk, Marin Barleti, shall chronicle the epic story of a man and a people that would defy an empire. As an eyewitness of the Ottoman conquest of Albania, he beheld the utter destruction of his homeland and was one of a few fortunate survivors of the last citadel of Albania to fall. As a youth, the Franciscans of Škoder educated him in Latin and the classics during the great heyday of the Italian Renaissance. Exiled from his motherland, he took upon himself the task of telling the world of the great struggle of the Albanian people under the leadership of Skanderbeg, their great warrior king against the Ottoman Empire. A contemporary of Skanderbeg, Barleti sought to rescue the deeds of this great man from being sentenced to silent oblivion. Join us and experience a nation's epic struggle for freedom. Through the centuries, along the great Eurasian steppes, nomadic peoples such as the Huns and Mongols advanced westward to conquer and subdue mighty nations and empires. Ruled by powerful leaders like Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan, the last and greatest of these nomads were the Ottoman Turks. They called themselves Osmanlis, followers of Osman. Osman was a ruler of a small state of Ghazi warriors in western Anatolia, the warriors of Islam. Like the legends of Rome, the Ottomans can go back to their own imperial origins and myths. According to legend, Osman has a dream. From his loins there sprang a tree, which as it grew came to cover the whole world with the shadow of its green and beautiful branches. Beneath it, Osman saw four mountain ranges, the Caucasus, the Atlas, the Taurus, and the Balkans. From its roots, there issued four rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Nile, and the Danube. The fields were rich with crops, the mountains thick with forest. In the valleys were cities adorned with domes, pyramids, obelisks, columns, and towers, all surmounted by the crescent. Their balconies rang with the call to prayer, their leaves started to lengthen into sword blades. A wind arose, pointing them toward the city of Constantinople. Located at the junction of two seas and of two continents, it seemed like a diamond mounted between two sapphires and two emeralds, and appeared thus to form the precious stone of the ring of a vast dominion which embraced the entire world. The descendants of Osman pursued this dream of universal empire. From 1300 to 1481 was a period of almost continuous Ottoman expansion through war, alliances, and the purchase of land. This was made possible by the cultural and military decline of the once great Byzantine Empire. With discipline and the policy of divide and conquer, the Ottomans defeated one nation after another. I suppose the main reason why the Ottomans were the successful group from the Ghazi states um, was their, lo their location. They were on the remaining frontier with the Byzantine Empire. Now that is how it's normally explained, but I think there's more to it than that. They were extremely effective in absorbing people, ideas, political and military elites, um, absorbing cultures. They were very eclectic and that gave them astonishing effectiveness. Now, it's one thing to learn from your enemy, but to actually, as it were, steal his clothes, steal his way of fighting, steal his military systems, and in fact, steal his troops, you know, get them to fight for you. This is what they did. It was quite remarkable. Conquests were not an easy task. There were setbacks. In 1402, the great disaster at Ankara brought the empire to its knees when Tamerlane defeated and captured the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid. After many years of civil war and dissension, the empire recovered and continued to expand. Under the leadership of two of the greatest sultans of the Ottomans, Murad II and Mehmet II, 
better known as Mehmed the Conqueror, the dream of Osman has not been forgotten. The Ottoman forces were poised to break and rush like a mighty wave over the Balkan Peninsula and the rest of Europe. Yet, one man would defy the empire of Osman. His name would strike terror to the Ottomans and give hope to Christian Europe. A legendary warrior, an Albanian that history shall remember as Skanderbeg. Our story begins in the mountainous country of Shupriya, land of the eagle, known to the world as Albania. In antiquity, it was called Illyria, and in the Middle Ages, Arboria. From time immemorial, the Albanians called themselves Shiptars, children of the eagle. The territory of Albania was divided between the Latin West and the Byzantine East, between Constantinople and Rome, split by the bitter rivalry of the two great centers of European civilization. Also within Albania, feudal families sought to expand their holdings at the expense of their weaker neighbors. This competition was further complicated by Venetian and Ottoman intervention. Unwilling or unable to unite, the Albanian feudal lords would fall one by one. The greatest of these lords was John Castriotti, truly a man of his time. The Castriota family uh, was uh, a rather new family. It was not uh, a part of this very old world of traditional Albanian noble families. They were newcomers. And it's quite probable that they were very aggressive newcomers. So they uh, conquered uh, territory belonging to other families. They came out from their mountains, from, uh, from the periphery of the Albanian, medieval Albanian space, and they pushed uh, through the mountains to the seaside. That's, uh, that was the most important uh, step taken by uh, Skanderbeg's uh, father to occupy one, one part of the Albanian coast and to get access uh, to the uh, Adriatic market. Voisava, his wife, bore him four sons and five daughters. The daughters were married to the most important families of northern Albania. History shall remember his youngest son, born in 1405 and christened Gerj Castriotti. Foretelling the destiny of the child, Barleti recounts the dream of Voisava. Some say that his mother, upon his conception, did dream that she gave birth to so great and huge a dragon that the same, having nearly covered the whole empire, did stretch out its head over the boundaries of Turkey and did devour and swallow them up with its bloody throat, dipping its tail in the sea towards the coasts of the Christians and especially towards the borders of the Venetians. Gerge Castriotti's early years are shrouded in mystery. John, his father, was defeated by Murad II and compelled to give his four sons to the Sultan as hostages to ensure his loyalty as a vassal. I want to say that the facts do not support that the Ottomans took Gerj Kastriotti and his three brothers hostage. The Sultan only took Gerj Kastriotti Skanderbeg as a hostage to ensure that John Kastriotti wouldn't rebel against the Sultan. Educated as Muslims at the School of Pages in the Sultan's palace, legend would have it that three of the boys were later treacherously poisoned. The evidence doesn't support Arleti's account that uh, Jish Castriotti was taken hostage as a young boy. As a matter of fact, uh, the Sultan Murad II doesn't achieve power until 1421. Therefore, Skanderbeg would have been way too old. Also, his brothers, the issue of his brothers being poisoned. We have evidence that his brothers survived well into the 1430s and 40s. So those two elements are, most historians agree, are incorrect. However, we must know why Barletti did this. Barletti was writing for a European reader. They understood the motif of the Moses analogy. Skanderbeg was raised uh, like Moses in the court of Pharaoh, where Skanderbeg was raised in, in the Sultan's palace. The death of the innocents, Moses, and even the story of Christ, the killing of the firstborn, so Barleti knew this and he puts this in the story because this is the beginning of a great heroic epic and he wants us to understand that 
this person is destined to achieve great things. Favored by the Sultan, Jerj, the youngest, being only nine years of age, was spared and converted to Islam. When one is converted, it is customary to change your name. The Sultan gave the young boy the name of Iskander. This was an acknowledgement of his kinship and ethnicity to Alexander the Great. Well, I think there's probably a connection in Skander Beg's mind and in the mind of his biographer with Alexander. In so far as Alexander was both a Macedonian and an Illyrian, and indeed from his mother's point of view, his mother's name is Olympias, from her point of view, he's her son and also the son of Zeus, and therefore in some sense partially divine. That is to say, if we want to look at it this way, he's not Macedonian at all. He's really Illyrian. By his intelligence and strength, he advanced rapidly in the Ottoman army. Skanderbeg didn't go to Turkey as a child. He went as an adult already developed and complete. My conclusion is that his assertiveness, his capabilities, and his strategy was copied by the Turks and not the other way around. As if to say, he brought a technique, a strategy from Europe to Asia Minor. These points should be reevaluated and analyzed so that Skanderbeg can be placed where he deserves. Displaying courage in battle, he was made an officer, a Sanjik Bey or commander of 5,000 cavalrymen, thereafter called Iskander Bey, Lord Alexander. Albanian and Western pronunciation altered it to the name that the world shall forever know him by, Skander Bey. In the 1430s, the winds of war were again blasting across the mountains of Albania. Ironically, it was in reaction to Ottoman reorganization. According to the historian Inilchik, this reveals a systematic two-stage process of conquest. The Ottomans first sought to establish some sort of control over the neighboring states. They then brought direct control over these countries by eliminating the native dynasties. Ottoman official records called defters recorded the population and resources. The population, as well as the landed nobility, resisted the statistical survey of Albania by the Ottomans. The nobles of large estates had most to lose. Like wildfire, the insurrection spread throughout the territories of central and northern Albania. Having signed a peace treaty with the Ottomans in 1430, Venice was unwilling to aid the Albanians. The Republic of Venice was adamant in suppressing the rebellion of the Albanian nobles. The Albanians were crushed in 1437 by superior Ottoman forces. According to Barleti, like Moses of old, Skanderbeg knew the suffering of his people in bondage. Biding his time, he remained overtly loyal to the Ottoman Empire. In 1442, Jean Castriotti died. Skanderbeg's patrimony was handed to a renegade Albanian, Hassan Bey, the governor of Kruja. This betrayal by the Sultan forces Skanderbeg to arrive at a fateful decision. More importantly, in 1443, supported by documents, we can say that Skanderbeg initiated contact with the Holy Office of the Vatican. For the first time, we find a letter that Pope Eugenius sends to Skanderbeg in 1443, and he invites him to return to the religion of his forefathers, the faith of Christianity, to gather a crusade in a war to drive off the Ottoman invaders from the Balkan lands once and for all. In 1443, Skanderbeg was sent with another Ottoman general against the revolting Hungarians led by Janos Hunyadis called the White Knight. He was feared and respected by the Turks. In November 1443, the armies met at Nish. The Battle of Nish, that's an interesting story right there in and of itself. What happens next is a long-standing controversy. As soon as Ottoman and Hungarian forces are about to engage in battle, Skanderbeg, in command of the Albanian auxiliary forces, 
deliberately turns his forces around and retreats. Now, this causes panic in the Ottomans. They never saw Skanderbeg do this before. If Skanderbeg is afraid, then something's going on. So this causes widespread panic, and they themselves start retreating, and then they're, in essence, mowed down by the Hungarians. The Hungarians smash the enemy forces. Some speculate of a conspiracy between Skanderbeg and Hunyadis. Whatever the case may be, these two leaders will be remembered as the greatest commanders of their time. After the battle, Skanderbeg locates the Sultan's scribe and forces him to forge an imperial firman, or order, for the governor of Kruja, ordering him to surrender to Skanderbeg, the fortress and governorship of Kruja, Mott and Dibra. To safeguard the secret, the Sultan's scribe is killed, as dramatized by the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in Tales of a Wayside Inn. Skanderbeg and 300 of his loyal Albanian troops march to the ancient castle of Kruja. So by the time of 1443, he's a very powerful figure in the Ottoman army. And the result of his defection and his return back home is also an indicator that he had Albanian-speaking troops around him. This is usually how the Ottoman system worked. It did not uh, rely on, let's say, commanders, if you will, military leaders, leading forces of other ethno-linguistic groups. The Turkish garrison is annihilated on November 28, 1443. The Ottoman banner is lowered, and Skanderbeg raises his family coat of arms, an imposing double-headed eagle on a blood-red field. The cry of freedom echoed throughout the mountains of Albania. After the taking of Kruja, within a month, Skanderbeg seized the castles of Petrella, Stolusi, Petralba, Modrici, and the great fortress of Svetograd on the Ottoman frontier. There was no going back. As proof of his intentions, he converted back to Christianity. This was not just a mere diplomatic move. What follows is a dark chapter in this period. The Muslim colonists and converts were invited to choose between Christianity or death. Most refused conversion and were ruthlessly massacred. The slaughter of the Muslims by Skanderbeg and the Albanians. According to Bishop Noli, the famous Albanian historian, uh, this was not a useless act of cruelty. In accordance with the fashion of time, it was a declaration of holy war, written in blood, a war from which there could be no retreat. Skanderbeg was burning his bridges behind him. Skanderbeg knew he could not face the wrath of the Sultan alone. He was aware of the failed rebellions of the 1430s, due in large part to a lack of a united command and coordination. On the 2nd of March, 1444, he convened a congress of the feudal lords of Albania. To avoid jealousy among the princes and to solicit the aid of the powerful Republic of Venice, the assembly convened at the Cathedral of St. Nicholas in Venetian-occupied Lesia. Skanderbeg and many Albanian nobles at that time felt threatened by the Ottoman administration. They uh, feared to be uh, depossessed by, by the Ottomans, so uh, to lose control on their traditional territory. And that's why they uh, gathered after the defeat of the Ottoman army in northern Albania, is this so-called League uh, of, of Lesia, of Alessio, uh, to defend their, uh, their own rights. Eter, the prince of Fort Teneruor, 
Lënd zotje e pushofshin krishter të anë se besuri, lëmen fun një farë neverie në majtë një lartë bese sotomane, ose me drejt lartë pabesi se tyre mase kartagenase. Le unë sot, nuk do të turbulojnë atë qëtësine atë leut, si një inisiator në noshta i urërë një luftë të rejë. Le nuk do të ushtyjnë a ju me unë gutë në të shtërsi lë rëzicet luftës për interesat lartëa, Si kur John Kastrio ti baba im. Skanderberg was, as I say, was offering the people um, some form of hope. Um, hope that they could maintain their identity, their religion, their, their freedom, their way of life, all these things that we get thrown at us even today. Um, this way of life thing I find sometimes rather suspect. But nonetheless, the Albanians are the... the at least Highland people of Albania in the 15th century, did have a rather distinctive way of life. Uh, their social organisation was rather different to that um, of most of the surrounding peoples. Um, put it in a very simplistic way, they were more free. Men fun, shmenoni per kruj, a mos pal një sytet, asi fortifikuar, asi përmenun për mjetër lëpucine e ti, ka qenë për të lenë durë të armikut, Si kur të mos kishim pik dashuri për atë le, si kur të mos kishim pik dashuri për nënë, nënë nërbri, kruja. Zemre e fuqi se arbrit le vetë mja që është dërturën nga të partë tonë në të gjitha avantajet si për ljufte për të pacë. Këtë sigurisht në qofë se si abajnë te për qefën vetët, zërë që mund të amohoni o etër fort të nëruarë. Un kam duruar bol, kam duruar bol. Tu a shikua gjerën këto dit, duar të e lyra me gjaku në të mivet, e që kum kalua gati gjithë vitet e moshes ma të embel me një rëzik atë sigur të për jetën. Pran vrasit të urër, zemra ime e din. They formed a league of Albanian princes in which Skanderbeg was elected commander-in-chief of the Army of the League. Tani, Tani o vlezër asë rasti le shpresa për të rifitur atë leon, mungur prej kohë për të rritur ljumëturin të uaj. Grehuni pra vlezër, grehuni të luftojnë për lirin tonë, për lirin e atë leot tonë, për nonen tonë. Jemë në ty që që ka së të jonë! He was elected as general of this league because uh, he was the most gifted warrior and he was the person who knew uh, best the Ottomans because he lived for so many years among them. So they accepted him as military leader for uh, a certain period. The Venetians allowed the meeting to take place in their territory in order to observe and spy. They seemed to encourage the Albanians, but made no commitments. Now, the Venetians tend to get a very bad press at that time from everybody except the Venetians, because they had a different way of looking at the world. They were merchants. They were great sailors, explorers, warriors, on sea and on land. But their real interests were making money. The armed forces of the League never exceeded the number of 10,000, mostly light cavalry. Roughly 75% were from Skanderbeg's own principality. Also, Barleti mentions Praetoria Cohors, a personal guard battalion composed entirely of the youth of Kruja. It was this small army of a few thousand veterans, unequaled for their discipline, courage and loyalty, which won all of Skanderbeg's victories. For their rebellion, Skanderbeg and the League shall face the reckoning. Sultan Murad II's ablest general, Ali Pasha, was given a command of 25,000 to invade Albania and punish Skanderbeg and the rebelling Albanians. The punitive expedition enters Albania and is met by an army of 10,000 under Skanderbeg. They are trapped in a narrow valley of Torrioli in Lower Dibra and massacred uh, June 29, 1444. Skanderbeg wins his first victory. 7,000 Turks killed, 500 captured, 2,000 Albanians were killed, and another 2,000 wounded. He carried out this guerrilla warfare because that was the only way he could do it. 
I mean, it's often been said the guerrilla guerrilla warfare is the, is the warfare of the weak against the strong. And I think that's entirely true um, because he recognised that this was the only way it could be done. But he also recognised that it could be done, that there was a possibility of success, and he inspired his followers and the bulk of the people for sufficient time to believe the same that this was worth the effort. Barleti concludes, lions on that day were led by lions. The news of this victory spread throughout the courts of Europe. Encouraged by this victory, Pope Eugene IV organized a united crusade which gave promise of success. Hungary signed an alliance with Skanderbeg. Under King Ladislaus, the Hungarians were encouraged to break their treaty with the Sultan and go on a crusade. Ladislaus and his army marched south and engaged the Ottomans under the command of Murad II at Varna, near the Black Sea. The Hungarians were brutally defeated, and Ladislaus, their king, was beheaded in battle. Skanderbeg was unable to reinforce the Crusader army. George Brankovic, the king of Serbia, who had given his daughter in marriage to Murad II, refused passage through his territory. In revenge, Skanderbeg raided the Serbian countryside. Along with the threat from the east, fear and betrayal was looming in the west. After the victory in Torvioli, the Venetians became fearful of a strong Albanian league that could threaten her possessions in Albania. In their opinion, Skanderbeg, not the Sultan, was the most dangerous enemy of Venice in Albania. Sowing discord among the members of the League, Venice acquired the city of Dogno. Skanderbeg claimed it in the name of the League and declared war on Venice. The Venetians were badly defeated, losing 2,500 men and 1,000 taken as prisoners at the Battle of Dream, July 23rd. 1448. Venice turned to the Ottomans for assistance. The Turks came and were crushed by Skanderbeg at the Battle of Oranik, August 14, 1448. The Venetians negotiated a peace treaty with Skanderbeg. It was a compromise on both sides. He could not wage a two-front war, and Venice found it impossible to defeat or assassinate the formidable one, as they would call him. In 1448, Skanderbeg achieves two great victories, one against the Venetians and another against the Ottomans, only within a few weeks of each other. Also, there was another great battle in 1448, and this is the second battle of Kosova, where Hunyadis, command of the Hungarian forces, meets Murad II at the same field of the great battle of 1389. Unfortunately, Hunyadis doesn't coordinate with Skanderbeg. He doesn't wait for Skanderbeg. Skanderbeg promised aid and was on his way, yet Hunyadis was impatient and his army was annihilated. And he was on his way retreating through Serbia and, and the rest of his forces were annihilated also by the king of Serbia. Had he been more patient, Skanderbeg would probably have pulled him out of the fire of that battle. Ever since the rebellion of Skanderbeg in 1443, Murad II had not forgotten the many insults to his honor and standing. His grievances against Skanderbeg were many. He revolted against his master seized his fortresses, massacred the Muslims, raided the lands of the Sultan and his Serbian father-in-law, and joined the crusade against Islam. The generals he sent against Skanderbeg were all defeated. This time Murad himself would conduct the invasion of Albania. An army of 80,000 besieged the frontier fortress of Svetigrad. The water supply was cut, and in July of 1449, Svetigrad was taken. Also, the southern fortress of Barat was also taken in this campaign. Murad II and his young son Mehmed would return the following year. The scale on which the invasion of Kruya was planned shows in itself how deep-seated was the Sultan's anger and how relentless his purpose. 160,000 men were assembled. The invading army marched onto Kruya, covered the surrounding plains, planted their cannons before its massive gates, and summoned the garrison to surrender. Before the siege, Skanderbeg placed a garrison of 1,500 in Kruja 
under the command of his most trusted officer, Count Farana, a defiant refusal was returned to the Sultan. One of the important defenders of the city of Kruja was Vrana Konti, a member of a distinguished noble family who faced two sieges of the castle of Kruja, defeating two sultans. Quite a lot of sources and commentators on this period um, highlight this idea of the, the hammer and the anvil, catching the enemy between a fortress which is held by your men and uh, your troops outside. Now where Skanderbeg is concerned, um, the castle is uh, under the command of a trusted lieutenant and he is in command of the field army outside. Now to be frank, that isn't very distinctive for him. That, in fact, was normal. If you're going to do that, the main commander is going to be on the outside, not on the inside. The Ottomans stormed the walls and were repulsed by such fury that over 8,000 Janissaries, an elite Ottoman division, perished in the combat. The secret of Skanderbeg's success for so many years, so he fought with such a small group against one, probably the best army in Europe at that time, was that his resistance was not centered in uh, urban centers, so city or fortresses, but that he was able to use the Albanian landscape, the mountains and especially the forests. Because at that time, it's quite uh, difficult to imagine this nowadays, so many parts of Albania that are now uh, completely open landscape, landscape were covered by forests. And in these forests, the small Albanian guerrilla groups moved quite easily. And this was the secret of uh, Skanderbeg's success. Meanwhile, Skanderbeg, poised like an eagle on the cliffs, waited until the battle was at its height. Then, swooping down on the unconscious foe, forced their trenches, fired the camp, and drove all before him with terrible havoc and slaughter. The Ottoman army was not able to maintain its siege for long enough, it didn't have sufficient control of the surrounding territory. Skanderbeg's men were still out there, attacking the Ottoman lines of communication. Harassed the besieging army night and day with his forces, intercepted convoys, disrupted communication, cut to pieces forces sent against them. After five long months, Murad was forced, compelled to abandon the siege and return back to Yedirne, demoralized, leaving behind 20,000 dead around the walls of Kuru losing even more in ambushes as it, during his retreat through Albania. In defeat, Murad II dies a few weeks later in January of 1451. But glory has a terrible price. Albania is in ruins. The massive walls of Kruja are now piles of rubble. The scorched earth policy of invader and defender alike has devastated the countryside, from Durs to Svetograd. Thousands are dead and maimed in over six years of continuous warfare. Money would be needed for reconstruction. The Albanian League fragmented since the war with Venice, with very few of the nobles remaining loyal to Skanderbeg. There was no doubt that the Ottomans would return to Albania. For in the east, Mehmed II has become Sultan. Sharp in features, with a penetrating gaze, he was cold and secretive in character. Mehmed's driving force was a calculated ambition to achieve at any cost absolute power. It suited him at the start of his reign to give an impression of peaceful intentions. The great historian Gibbon writes, peace was on his lips, but war was in his heart. His attention and energies were focused on taking Constantinople. Meanwhile in Albania, Skanderbeg would forge a treaty of alliance with the Kingdom of Naples. This was a diplomatic masterstroke, worthy of a true Renaissance prince. King Alphonse V of Naples ruled a vast Mediterranean empire. He even claimed to be heir to the throne of Jerusalem. Now, Alfonso the Magnanimous is really one of the most interesting figures of the 15th century. He was born in 1396. He lived until 1458. He started as a king, well, a prince, really, in Spain, who eventually acquired the throne of Aragon, Catalonia, Valencia, Mallorca. And then in 1442, he conquered Naples as part of a great scheme which he had 
which involved two things, really. One was trying to establish himself as the greatest power in Italy. But he also saw himself as somebody who, quite apart from his Italian ambitions, would be able to establish mastery in the Mediterranean as a whole. Skanderbeg and Alphonse were natural allies, since Turkey and Venice were their common enemies. The Treaty of Gaeta was signed on March 25, 1451. Skanderbeg would acknowledge Alphonse as his overlord. The League of Albanian Princes was reorganized under King Alphonse, with Skanderbeg as Captain General of the Crown of Aragon, receiving economic and military assistance from the king. All of this was in preparation for a crusade against the Ottomans, which Alphonse was masterminding. Among the many honors and titles given by Alphonse to Skanderbeg, we may include membership into a secret order of knights called the Society of the Dragon, a crusading order dedicated to the defense of the church and the expulsion of the Turks from Europe. The Society of the Dragon, or Sukiatatis Draconis Tarum, was Skanderbeg a member of this order? Barleti is the only one, and it's my theory, Barleti is hinting at us in the story of the dream of Oisapa, Skanderbeg's mother, that uh, she gives birth to a dragon, and Skanderbeg is the dragon. Now, members of the order are called dragons, dracons. So, is Barleti hinting at us? It's a secret order, it's a secret society. Uh, could Skanderbeg be a member? We don't know. The only evidence we have is the dream of Oisapa, and this is a, a story, but we do know that Alphonse V was a member of this order, and he, so was uh, Vlad Dracul's father. And that's where he gets the name Dracul, son of the dragon, Vlad Dracula, another contemporary of Skanderbeg. Skanderbeg always considered Alphonse like a father figure to him, and that's another way of becoming a member of the order, if you're one of the initial members and also be, being a son of a member. So, Berlati might be hinting at us through the centuries. After achieving a strong foreign alliance, Skanderbeg had to unify his internal authority. He had to win back the support of Jerj Adianiti, the second most powerful prince of Albania. Adianiti was a rich man and the greatest of the landed proprietors. Fortunately, he also had a daughter, Andronika or Danika, to her intimates. Skanderbeg would take Danika as his wife, only after striking a hard bargain in the dowry. Following the wedding, Skanderbeg and his bride visited cities and castles throughout the country, receiving congratulations. Meanwhile, after years of preparation and planning, and even more years in the dreaming, Mehmed II would add another crown to the Ottoman Sultanate, Emperor of the Roman Empire. On May 29, 1453, Constantinople, the capital of the once great Byzantine Empire, has fallen to the Ottoman invaders. Emperor Constantine XI died bravely with the last defenders. Mehmed triumphantly entered the stricken city and set to the work of rebuilding. He changed the name of the city to Istanbul, and now he would be called Mehmed Fatih, Mehmed the Conqueror. Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror, Mehmed II, Mehmed Fatih, uh, was seen I think perhaps more significantly by certain members of the, of the, the Christian elite um, rather than the uh, Muslim elite who would have had a different way of looking at him, but members of the Greek Orthodox religious and political elite as a sort of new emperor. He who controls Rome is emperor and by that was meant the new Rome, that is Constantinople. So by becoming ruler of Constantinople, Mehmet became the new emperor. Western Christendom was struck with a sense of doom. Long enshrined among the myths of history, this event marks the turning point between the Middle Ages and the modern age. Far more pragmatic, Istanbul commands the axis between the continents of Europe and Asia. The great problem in Italy in this period was trying to work together against the Turks because Italy in the period from about the 1440s right through to the end of the 15th century 
was essentially divided among five great states, of which the Kingdom of Naples was the largest and in some respects the most powerful. But there was also Milan, Venice, which had a major influence in Albania as well, Florence and the papacy. And the rivalries of these particular powers and also lesser powers which were sandwiched in between them tended to distract the Italian powers from what they also saw as a major duty, which was joining together in a great crusade against the Turks. Skanderbeg enters now the international stage. He was uh, perceived as one of the most successful leaders in the Balkans, especially after the fall of Constantinople. He became a key figure for uh, Italian uh, poli policy makers. Because after the fall of Constantinople and after the uh, Serbian despotate had been uh, terribly weakened by the Ottoman attacks, there was only one leader uh, in the south, Skanderbeg, and another one uh, in the north, John Hunyadi, um, who enjoyed the confidence of Europe and uh, who seemed to be able uh, to resist uh, the Ottoman advance. The Venetians and Neapolitans, in response, reached a temporary understanding. They must go now on the offensive. They must retake the fortress of Berat. A force of 2,000 Neapolitans with siege artillery was sent to support Skanderbeg's 12,000. The city was besieged and ready to surrender, and a brief truce was signed. Leaving behind the bulk of his force at Berat, Skanderbeg went and prepared to attack another castle. Without the commander present, the Albanian forces were attacked by an Ottoman army of 40,000 cavalry, July 1455. All of the Italian contingents were killed. Half the Albanian army was annihilated. This was known as the Great Disaster of Berat. Encouraged by Venice, most of the Albanian princes deserted Skanderbeg. Even his greatest general, Moses of Dibra, betrayed him and joined the enemy. Skanderbeg defeats Moses and his invading army of 15,000 Turks on May 19, 1456. A repentant Moses returns to Kruja is pardoned by Skanderbeg and is given his command back. Well, he takes him back because he needs Moses. Moses is an important leader. He has his people on the frontier. The Debrans are great warriors. He needs them. And also he knows full well that now that Moses betrays him and he comes back, Moses just betrayed the Sultan. And he knows full well there's no way Moses can go back to the Sultan. So in, that's, in many ways, Skanderbeg knows full well that Moses will be loyal to death. Betrayal was not an uncommon practice. Victory must be fed by victory. Any setback can break alliances and loyalties. The most infamous betrayal was by Skanderbeg's nephew, Hamza Kastriotti, the son of his eldest brother. And even within his uh, own family, so famous case of Hamza Kastriota, but probably also of other nephews uh, of Skanderbeg, we can see that rivalries were quite common and that no one uh, feared to, uh, to go over to the, uh, to the Sultan. And it was a fascina fascinating game the Albanian nobility played at that time. So there were two poles, Skanderbeg and the Sultan, and they moved between these two poles and they tried to negotiate their own position in a changing world. With the support of an army of 80,000 Turks, Hamza was acclaimed the new ruler of Albania. Feigning defeat, Skanderbeg took refuge in the mountains. The whole story, uh, if you try to reconstruct the political and military events, is sometimes a kind of chaos, of complete political chaos. And Skanderbegs very often just had uh, to try to survive. He was, we see him often fleeing through the mountains, uh, followed by superior Ottoman armies or uh, by other Albanians. And it is a miracle that he uh, survived for 25 years. And he survived because he was, without any doubt, uh, a genial uh, military leader. September 2nd, 1457, on the coast of Albulena, Skanderbeg and his forces fell on the enemy and scattered them to the four winds. The number of Ottoman dead ranged from 15,000 to 30,000. Hamza was captured and sent to Naples for imprisonment. Pope Calixtus III was jubilant over the victory, 
He was Skanderbeg's greatest panegyrist, giving him the title of Athleti Christi, Athlete of Christ. We can assume it because uh, Skanderbeg had uh, maintained so, so, so close uh, con- such close contacts to uh, the highest uh, representatives of the Catholic uh, Church in Albania. Uh, all these abbots, archbishops and bishops in his uh, personal environment uh, al- allow us to conclude that uh, he felt closer to the Catholic Church at that time. And there was another reason um, why he um, uh, he felt rather alienated uh, towards the Orthodox Church, because at that time the Orthodox Church had already found its own arrangement with the Ottoman Sultans. And the Orthodox Church, um, after the fall of Constantinople, the, in the Central Balkans, did not support anti-Ottoman resistance. 1458 would be a turning point in Skanderbeg's career. Three of his most loyal allies will die. Pope Calixtus III, King Alphonse V, and Count Varana. In many ways now, Skanderbeg is left truly alone. The death of Calixtus III, Alphonse V, Count Varana, his most trusted general. Also a couple years earlier in 1456, Janos Hunyadi dies in Bagrad after the siege of Bagrad of the, of the plague. So in many ways he has to recreate new alliances, uh, new support. He's the only one left of the old guard. Another fascinating question is why Skanderbeg continued the resistance if, as we sometimes told, it was, it was hopeless. The Ottoman Empire was on the crest of its, of its wave and it was sweeping all before it. I mean, who but a sort of suicidal idiot would try and resist this? And people are not like that. Well, most leaders aren't and great leaders aren't. He must have thought, not only he must have thought, but his supporters, more importantly, must have thought that there was a chance of winning. And in a certain, to a certain extent, they did. I mean, they preserved their identity. Now, how could they hope to do this? In a way, that's even more important than how they actually did it. It's how they hoped to do it. What was the plan, insofar that there was a plan and such? They were looking, clearly, westward. They were looking across the Adriatic, not just to southern Italy, in fact, not just to Italy, but the whole of the, the Catholic, Christian, Western European world, um, with which Albania had always had a very close relationship. In preparation for the approaching storm, he would have to create new alliances. Skanderbeg's loyalty to his friend, King Alphonse, would soon be put to the test. Ferrante, the bastard son of King Alphonse, inherits the kingdom of Naples. Well, the problems really began to arise when Alfonso died. And there was a sense throughout the whole of Italy that this great charismatic figure had now passed away and that his son wasn't in a position to rival his father. And that this was for a very good reason, that all that Ferrante, the son, got was the south of Italy. He didn't even get the island of Sicily, he didn't get Sardinia, he didn't get the Spanish territories, which went to the brother of Alfonso. So there was this difficult position where Ferrante, who was an illegitimate son, had to justify his claim to the throne. The nobles rebelled against him. Ferrante and Pope Pius II appealed to Skanderbeg for help. He agreed, but first he needed to make peace with Venice. They happily accepted and put an end to the ten-year-long undeclared war. Next would come negotiations with the powerful Dukagini family of northern Albania. Paul Angeli, the young upstart Albanian Archbishop of Durs, negotiated the peace. He becomes Skanderbeg's foreign minister and shall prove himself a power player in the snake pit that was Italian Renaissance diplomacy. So this uh, Paul Angelos was probably one of the most impressive persons of that of that time and uh, only recently so historiography really appreciated his role because he was not only a great organizer it was he uh, who established a peace between Leka Tukacin and Skanderbeg in 's last diplomatic move was to sign a brief armistice with Mehmed the Conqueror. 
This was the first declared peace for Albania in over 18 years of continuous warfare. Skanderbeg comes in and he gives his support to Ferrante against Ferrante's most bitter enemy, who is the Prince of Taranto, Balzo Orsini. And this is very interesting because we actually have correspondence between not just Ferrante and Skanderbeg, but between Balzo Orsini and Skanderbeg. It, it's very peculiar correspondence because Balzo Orsini is trying to persuade Skanderbeg not to fight on behalf of Ferrante. He's clearly scared of this man. And we know that Skanderbeg's troops, the Stradiots, could do enormous damage. They did great damage to the, the sheep. There were enormous amounts of sheep who were pastured in the south of Italy in this period, and they were a major source of profit to the king and to the princes and so on. So Skanderbeg's troops, when they arrive, wreak havoc. And this is something which the Prince of Taranto knows is going to undermine his own financial position. Recalling the kindness and generosity of Alphonse V, Skanderbeg responds to the rebel leader Orsini, I am the friend of virtue and not of fortune. He further adds that his great ancestor Pyrrhus of Epirus crossed the Adriatic and showed the Romans the warrior quality of his people. Uh, Skanderbeg, I think, wasn't cut off from Renaissance ideas. One of the very interesting things that you see in his letters, in this correspondence, is the way that he compares himself to Pyrrhus of Epirus, the great classical hero. And the fact that he invokes this name in a way that an Italian would have been very aware of, of this classical heritage suggests to me that the court of Skanderbeg was drawing on some of these Renaissance ideas, that it wasn't just a sort of remote, isolated Balkan court, but they also they were interested in Latin culture. They were trying to plug in to these great intellectual developments which were taking off in Italy in this period. As if to say, Skanderbeg wasn't just a personality of war. We can call him a personality within his surroundings that elevated the culture, elevated the nation, resulting in the complete elevation of a thriving country of Europe. On August 25, 1461, Skanderbeg arrived at Barleta with an expeditionary force of 3,000 cavalry and archers. He broke the siege of Barleta and freed King Ferrante from the rebel forces encircling him. Skanderbeg raided the enemy territory and devastated it with fire and sword. Skanderbeg had to help Ferrante out of the Albanian code of honor and loyalty which he owed Ferrante's father, Alphonse, which helped him in his dire time and need. And so Ferrante would always consider Skanderbeg almost like a father. Skanderbeg uh, shocked not only uh, so his enemies in the Balkans, but also in Italy with, um, let's say, some kind of tactics or strategies which we can call also brutality. We have, uh, for instance, a text from Italy, so during the exp expedition in southern Italy, that the Italians were simply shocked that uh, Skanderbeg uh, made no prisoners. He just killed them. This can be explained by the fact that uh, in the Albanian mountains, with his rather small army, uh, prisoners were for Skanderbeg just a burden. A burden. Um, and he had to get rid of them. As, as quickly as possible. And putting them to death is, so was uh, the most efficient way. Well, I think one of the problems that the French often faced when they were up against Stradiots or indeed light cavalry of the sort that Skanderbeg deployed against the Turks or that the Turks deployed in the Balkans was that these heavily armed knights actually were quite vulnerable to very mobile troops, whether they were foot soldiers or light cavalry. Uh, and they'd never learned this lesson, really. It goes back to the early Crusades. When you go back to the period of Skanderbeg, actually, you can see that the Stradiots did introduce an element of violence, which I don't think was there before. In the words of Pontano, Chancellor for King Ferrante, Skanderbeg's name and his arrival not only confounded the plans of the enemy, but filled all of Italy with his fame and glory.
he's also achieved a propaganda success. And the reason for this, of course, is that if you read the Italian documents of the period, Skanderbeg comes across in his own lifetime as a great legendary figure. And this is extraordinary. If you read the diplomatic dispatches sent to Milan in the 1450s, they will tend to say things like uh, Skinderbecco, they call it Skinderbecco, is coming. Everything will change. The great Skinderbecco, he will transform everything. And they see him as this great heroic figure who's larger than life. And of course he was larger than life. He was a big man and an imposing figure. Uh, and this has an enormous impact, therefore, on public opinion dealing with this legendary, heroic figure, this new Alexander the Great. January 1462. Skanderbeg receives a message from his wife Donica that Ottoman forces were gathering on the frontier. He returns to Albania to engage the enemy. The Republic of Venice, feeling threatened by the unexpected success of Skanderbeg's mission, urged the Sultan to break the treaty and attack Albania. Skanderbeg was betrayed by Venice and the Albanian nobles loyal to the Republic. Mehmed was determined to crush him and his small corps of loyal warriors. Three Ottoman armies were unleashed by the Sultan and invaded Albania in August of 1462. They were under the command of his best generals. The first expedition was defeated at Mokrena of Dibra. The second expedition was engaged and annihilated at Pelog of Tetova. The third Ottoman army was trapped and destroyed in Levad at Okrida. Skanderbeg achieved three remarkable victories within a single month. Mehmed the Conqueror, left with three devastated armies, offers a 10-year peace treaty to Skanderbeg. Skanderbeg was unwilling at first to accept the offer of the Sultan. But his generals and his fellow nobles begged him to accept the peace treaty. They could not sustain a two-front war with Venice and the Ottomans. So he accepts the decision of the League. In April 1463, the Peace of Skopje is signed. Skanderbeg and Mehmed have concluded a 10-year peace treaty. The treaty did not affect the authority of the Pope over Albania. Skanderbeg was prepared to declare war against Mehmed at any time the Pope should order. Skanderbeg would not have to wait long for the call to war. The Pope's original name was Aenea Silvio Piccolomini. He changed it to Pius II when elected Pope in 1458. He was an outstanding Italian humanist and an astute politician. The main goal during his pontificate was to unite Christendom in a crusade against the Turks at a time when they threatened to overrun all of Europe. Pius II sends a 64-page letter to the Sultan, inviting him to become a Christian. A trifle can make thee the most celebrated of mortals, and this trifle is not difficult to find. Aqua Poxilium, just a little water which will make thee a Christian, a servant of God and the Gospel. We shall name thee Emperor of the Greeks and the Orient. Not one prince on earth will surpass you in glory and power. Mehmed had already achieved these goals without conversion. Such approaches would never have influenced him. He saw himself as an instrument of Allah, an heir to the caliphs, thus wedded spiritually and politically to Islam. Venice was alarmed by the peace of Skopje and made friendly overtures to Skanderbeg. Pius II, now in ill health, was adamant to lead a crusade against the Turks. The stage was now being set for the final struggle. The Ottomans had, at the beginning of the 1460s, um, conquered more or less the whole Balkans. The kingdom of Bos Bosnia had fallen, uh, the Serbian despot had uh, even some years earlier, and Albania and Dalmatia were now the uh, outposts of the Christian world. And the Italian states, 10 years after the fall of Constantinople, they, they realized that now serious steps had to be taken to oppose the uh, Ottoman expansion to the Western Balkans. Skanderbeg entrusted the negotiations to his most talented and gifted diplomat, Paul Angeli, the Archbishop of Durs. On August 20th, 1463, Venice and Skanderbeg concluded an alliance. 
der Archbischof of Durazzo uh, was an extremely gifted negotiator. He knew that uh, involving Albania, involving Iskanderbeg in this great project of a crusade uh, of uh, Pius II would be an extremely risky enterprise. Skanderbeg uh, risked everything he had, so central Albania, his control on the land and his armistice uh, with the Sultan. So the Pope and Italian states, they had to offer something to Skanderbeg. And what they were prepared to offer, or what uh, the Archbishop demanded, was uh, the crown, the coronation of Skanderbeg to the King of Albania and Epirus. November 1463. Pius declares a crusade against the Turks and invites all Christian nations to join him. Paul Angeli negotiated terms with the Pope. Skanderbeg was to be made Captain General of the Holy See, effective military commander of all crusading armies. Upon the landing of the crusading forces at Ragusa, Skanderbeg would be crowned by the Pope, King of Albania and Epirus. Paul Angeli would be made Cardinal of Albania. The Archbishop of Durazzo, who was an excellent uh, connoisseur of the Italian Renaissance world because he had visited the courts of Naples, Rome and Milan, and he knew uh, Venice uh, very well. He was also uh, a superb connoisseur of the ancient literature, fashionable at that time. He commissioned this helmet to symbolize uh, the new image of uh, independent uh, Albanian principality. And Jaili may have also orchestrated not only the crowning of a king, but the dream of a new Alexander. Skanderbeg would be transformed into a Christian Alexander the Great. In a similar way, Skanderbeg as a new Alexander can be seen as someone who's going to recover what has been taken away in the Balkan Peninsula, which has been taken away by the Turks and by the Muslims. So in that sense, again, he's a, another Alexander, and um, that the struggle between West and East, or East and West, is revived here again. And in, in some sense, there's certainly historical truth, because this entire area, uh, from the Balkans all the way to the Near East, has been under contention for many, many centuries, indeed millennia. And we could say even today that there's that, that same tension between East and West. For centuries, the crown and its symbolic meaning has been shrouded in myth and legend. Perhaps we may finally understand and appreciate the genius in design and the purpose for which it was made. We can follow uh, the steps taken by the Archbishop, uh, by the Archbishop to prepare the crown for this great project. He commissioned a crown for Skanderbeg. It's the famous uh, helmet now uh, conserved in uh, the Museum of Vienna. And this helmet is just an original copy of Alexander the Great's helmet. It's, in fact, the royal crown of ancient Macedonia. Why did they choose this symbol? The answer is quite simple. Wasn't Alexander the Great's mother, Olympias, uh, any pirate uh, princess? Was Skanderbeg's name not only the Turkish version of Alexander's name? Skanderbeg was already known as Alexander uh, in the Orient and in the Occident. If Alexander had had a war helmet with goat horns, we would expect some scholars in antiquity to have made note of this because it would have been an anomaly, a disjunction, a conflict. But we hear nothing of this at all. So unfortunately, it's probably not likely that Skanderbeg's helmet actually goes back directly to Alexander's helmet. But it's my belief that the helmet of Pyrrhus may be the ancestor of the helmet of Skanderbeg through transmission in Epirote and Illyrian culture. It was only recently that uh, the true meaning of this helmet was discovered and it was really quite a puzzle, a uh, criminalistic puzzle. 
because we have uh, as evidence the helmet itself and its true meaning. It's, uh, so what he symbolizes was discovered by a German colleague, uh, Professor Franke from Munich. And then you had only combined this to combine this evidence with some documents from the archives of Milan who show uh, the Archbishop of Durazzo at the court of Milan in the year 1464, so the year when the crusade should be realized. And one of these documents speaks of a gift given by the Duke of Milan, Francesco Sforza, to the Archbishop of Durazzo. So different parts of uh, armories and weapons. And it's very probable that the helmet was part of this gift. So if we combine uh, the evidence, it's quite probable that the helmet was uh, commissioned uh, at the beginning of the 1460s. This is also confirmed by the analysis of art historians. We know that the helmet was produced in northern Italy at, uh, at, uh, exactly at that time. And then if we combine all this evidence, this fascinating and exciting story of Skanderbeg as the new Alexander the Great and Skanderbeg as king of Albania and the Pyrrhus uh, becomes quite probable. There is an interesting contrast and in blending pre-Christian and Christian elements on this helmet. I've already talked about the pre-Christian element of the, the coat skull and the horns. But of course there's an inscription on the helmet as well, uh, which if I can read it says, Jesus Nazarensus Principi de Mattiae Regi Albanorum, Terrori Ottomanorum, Regi Epirotum Benedicti. Jesus of Nazareth blesses the Prince of Amathea, the King of the Albanians, the Terror of the Turks, and the King of the Epirotes. One interesting thing about the acronyms on the helmet itself is that they spell out in Latin, actually a little bit more in Italian, but it's very similar. Imperatore, in, in Latin it would just simply be imperator, which has a couple of very important meanings, and one of which is uh, Captain General, Supreme Leader, Supreme General. This was a concept that was prevalent in the Roman Republic, the late Republic. The second meaning is of Emperor. Our word Emperor comes from Imperatore. What strikes me most in my work, I'm trying to find a classical antecedent to Scandinavian helmet, is in fact the Illyrian or Albanian connection between Scanderbeg and antiquity. And so I think it would be wrong to actually try to assimilate him to being a Macedonian or being a Greek, certainly, as being a Slav. I mean, he's an Albanian, that's what comes across most clearly. On November 27, 1463, with Venice now as an ally, the Pope giving him command of the Crusading Army, Captain General, he breaks the peace treaty that he has with Mehmed and declares war on the Ottoman Empire. He begins the invasion and raiding of the Ottoman territory of Macedonia. The Pope left Rome on June 18, 1464 for the rendezvous of the Christian armies in Ancona, an Adriatic seaport on the east coast of Italy. After the forces were assembled, he was to put himself at the head of the crusade and sail for Ragusa to meet the King of Hungary and Skanderbeg. Most of the armies failed to show up, and Pius dies on August 14, 1464. His heart was buried at Ancona, still facing, as it were, the infidel East. His body was taken to Rome and there buried in St. Peter's. His crusade followed him to the grave. On the very same day of the death of the Pope, Skanderbeg defeated an Ottoman army under the command of Shermet Bey near the lake of Okrida. He returns to Kruja only to hear about the death of Pius II and the collapse of the crusade. Today, the crown of Skanderbeg remains in a marble palace, mute and still, to an age that almost was. Now Skanderbeg was left alone to face the full wrath of Mehmed and the Ottoman Empire. He had also uh, to reckon with a changing political world, not only in the Balkans, where this the whole network of potential allies broke away. 
So there was at the beginning of his uprising, there was still a Bosnian kingdom, a principality in what is nowadays Montenegro, Montenegro, Zeta at that time, so the Cernojevici, a Serbian despotate. There were different principalities, Greek principalities in Epirus and in Moria. But at the end of his life, all these territories, all these Christian states uh, had disappeared and he was quite alone. In the year of 1465, five successive armies were sent to invade Albania, the final death blow to Albanian resistance. The worst was yet to come. The Sultan entrusted the command of these forces to Balaban Pasha, one of the most distinguished generals of the Ottoman Empire. Like Skanderbeg, Balaban Pasha was an Albanian, raised in the Ottoman court as a youth, expert in military tactics and guerrilla warfare. And some historians even say that he was one of the first uh, during the conquest of Constantinople to plant the flag of the Turks. The night before their first battle, Balaban Pasha sends gifts to Skanderbeg. This was the customary behavior of opposing commanders, an acknowledgement of nobility as well as equals. Skanderbeg sends gifts as well. However, they were the tools and utensils of a peasant farmer, reminding Balaban Pasha of his humble origins and class. Leave the command of armies to those born to do so. The deadly duel between these two warriors would continue for three more bloody years. In their second battle, Skanderbeg's best generals were captured by Balaban Pasha, Moses of Dibra, Skanderbeg's second in command, Vladan Yoritsa, his most trusted advisor, his nephew, Muzaki Topia, and other officers. They were sent to the Sultan. He refused Skanderbeg's offer to ransom them. They were subsequently skinned alive. Albania was being bled white by this struggle. In manpower and resources, the country was drained and exhausted. It would be really interesting to know more about how Skanderbeg actually managed to keep his people on side for so long. Because they were. I, to some extent, I mean, you can overestimate, overstate these things, but um, they were suffering, and they suffered for more than half a generation, almost a generation. Um, I mean, the people of, 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 of the main castle of Kruja, how did, not only how did they keep this going, why did they keep it going? And that brings us to, to this basic question of, of, of hope and inspiration and leadership. It's to be a great leader is to make to inspire people to follow you, um, but people have got to have a reason to follow you. I mean, you don't hypnotize half a nation into maintaining an apparently hopeless struggle for it for a, for a generation. This particular hero clearly tapped into something. He was. I suppose you could put it simply, he was giving the people something they wanted. This to me is what leadership is all about. In June of 1466, Mehmed would command in person the invasion of Albania against Skanderbeg, whom neither his father nor his generals had been able to subdue. He was uh, in a certain sense also quite stubborn. As we know, uh, the Ottoman chronicles depict the Albanians as a very stubborn people. So uh, they're in, the, in the Albanian translations, it's cockfort, and I think one should not uh, generalize, uh, generalize mentalities. But the, the Ottomans, after all the attempts they made to, to bribe the Albanians, to co convince them to, e to end this uh, in their uh, senseless resistance, they came to the conclusions that these people were extremely stubborn and that's why extreme force had to be used to subdue them. 15th century Ottoman chronicles record that at this time the Sultan declared a holy war against the Albanians. Mehmet put himself at the head of the entire imperial army, 
estimated to be over 150,000 men. This declaration of holy war against the Albanians is quite unique for Mehmet because he would normally avoid doing such things. He was very shrewd, political, very modern in many ways leader, and so quite tolerant of religion. So why would he do this? Well, in many ways, Skanderbeg and the Albanians have thwarted his plans and his father's plans. A year earlier, a crusade was about to be launched against him. This man has become now an obsession for him. These people have thwarted his dream of a universal empire. The stumbling block to Rome itself. The analyst Tursun records it as a war to exterminate the Albanians. This multitude of armed men burst like a huge avalanche on the country, covering the land with fire and blood. In June, the Sultan besieged Kruja. The garrison of 4,400 men was under the command of the loyal Tanush Topia. Based in the nearby mountains, Skanderbeg would strike and harass the besieging army. For the next two months, the sound of huge cannons echoed off the sides of the mountains, and the screams of thousands upon thousands filled the dry, dusty air. Mehmed gave command of the siege to Balaban Pasha, leaving him with an army of 80,000. Before departing Albania, the Sultan had the fortress of Albasan built as a base of operations. This time, the Ottoman armies were to stay in Albania year-round. The rules of traditional warfare were abandoned. This was total war. In 1467, uh, Albania, central Albania, had suffered already the second main attack by the Ottoman armies, led personally by uh, Mehmet the Conqueror. And Mehmet had learned from the setbacks of uh, earlier Ottoman attacks against uh, Skanderbeg's Albania. And he radically, he decided to change radically the tactics and to go over to a strategy of total war. He had understood that the main ally of Skanderbeg was the Albanian nature, the forest and the countryside. And uh, so the hiding uh, posts of the Albanian population on the mountains. That's why he decided to destroy one part of the forest, so to clear the forest along the main roads. Skanderbeg was in desperate need of money and supplies. In December 1466, still at war, he is forced to go to Rome. Then in January 1467, to Naples, to try and persuade Pope Paul II and King Ferrante to give him the aid he so desperately needed. But at that time it was already too late because the Italians had uh, just uh, lost interest, the interest in Albania. Skanderbeg for them was a loser. They knew that the political quest, the question of the future of Albania, of central Albania, was already decided it would fall into the hand of the Ottoman Sultan. Skanderbeg returns home disappointed with the results of his visit. In April 1467, he wins another victory, putting to flight an Ottoman army which was coming to the aid of Balaban Pasha. was broken. In the battle that followed, Balaban Pasha, caught in a trap between Skanderbeg's army and Tanush Topia's garrison, was mortally wounded and died soon after.
The Venetians were less upset at the destruction of Albania than the construction of the Elbasan Fortress. It commanded a position on the navigable Shkumbin River, which the Turks could use to reach the Adriatic Sea with their ships. This time, the city-states of Italy were worried. Rome, Naples, Venice, and Milan feared that the Sultan not only wanted to wipe out the Albanians, but cross into Italy. If, God save us, the Albanian coast is occupied, the Venetian Senate wrote to Pope Paul II, the enemy will only have to cross into Italy as soon as it judges the time right, to the greatest detriment of all Christendom. In July 1467, Mehmed returned with an army as large as the previous year and was again before the walls of Kruja. Failing to storm the fortress, Mehmed let his vast armies loose to devastate with fire and sword every corner of Albania he could reach. Many of the Ottoman detachments were ambushed and cut to pieces by Skanderbeg. After a few weeks, the Sultan returned to Constantinople in humiliation and defeat. Skanderbeg called a meeting of the Congress of Albanian nobles. Like a quarter of a century earlier, it was to be held at Lesia, while an Ottoman army marched from the north into Albania. The last days of Skanderbeg's life have been mythologized into many stories. One of the most popular versions has him wandering through the forests of Albania. His road is barred by the Angel of Death. Skanderbeg challenges the Grim Reaper to combat. Realizing his irrational dare, he turns around and accepts that even he must surrender to his own mortality. Skanderbeg was preparing to meet the enemy when he was suddenly struck down by an attack of fever. Exhausted by so many trials, he could not resist the illness. Gerg Castriotti, Skanderbeg, died on January 17, 1468. He was buried in the cathedral of St. Nicholas at Lesia, the very same place where he and the Albanians, a quarter century earlier, forged their national covenant. The news of his death spread throughout Christendom. Immediately, the Venetian Senate dispatched the Archbishop of Durs to obtain from Skanderbeg's widow and son the right to defend Kruja and the other fortresses with Venetian garrisons. Permission was granted. The death of Skanderbeg left a great void in Albania. The hero's son, Jean, was only 14 and still too young to take the place of his father. He left the country with his mother, Donica Castriotti, to settle in the Kingdom of Naples. After Skanderbeg's death, so the whole Castriota family moved to Italy and they were welcomed there with great honors. And we know uh, that, they, uh, that they actually lived in uh, Manfredonia. So Ferrante felt the obligation uh, to take care of the Castriota family. But in Italy, he knew that the situation uh, in Albania was lost. With the death of Skanderbeg, uh, many of the nobles fled Albania and moved to Italy. Not only they, but thousands of Albanians. Mass migration, refugees, uh, went into Italy, southern Italy, and settled there. But the invaders had not seen the end of the resistance. The Albanian forces found a new leader in the person of Lac Dukagini, a formal rival and later a close collaborator of Skanderbeg. 
Upon hearing of the death of his great rival, Mehmed declared, Woe unto Christendom, Europe is mine, for she has lost both her sword and shield. The great obstacle to his dream of universal empire was dead and gone. The Sultan planned to break the Albanian resistance once and for all and to take the Albanian coastal towns from the Venetians in order to invade Italy and then Rome. A great army led by Mehmed returns to Albania in the spring of 1478 and lays siege to Kruja. The defenders were forced by starvation and lack of arms to give up the citadel on June 16, 1478. In spite of the solemn pledge to spare the lives of the brave defenders, Mehmed ordered them to be massacred in cold blood while their women and children were dragged away into slavery. In 1479, Mehmed came in person to besiege the Venetian stronghold of Skoder, whose castle lay like a crown on top of a hill, fortified since Illyrian days. The story of the heroic defense is told by Barleti, who witnessed the siege and counted the huge stone shells crashing into the city every day in ever-increasing numbers and size. Venice, on the verge of total defeat, is forced to sign a peace treaty with the Sultan. Master of the country at last, the road to Italy was finally clear. In July 1480, an Ottoman army of 10,000 men set sail from Vlor for the port of Otranto, the most easterly town of Italy. On the 8th of August, the citadel of Otranto is taken. The Ottoman Turks now possessed an Italian bridgehead. Rome and Italy were spared Ottoman conquest by the unexpected death of Mehmed II on the 3rd of May, 1481, at the age of only 49. So I think that uh, we can say quite seriously that it was Skanderbeg who uh, protected Italy for at least uh, 20 years from direct attack uh, from the Ottoman armies. Albania was to remain under Turkish rule for more than four centuries and did not begin to find her national freedom again until 1912. All people of the Middle Ages that did not create a national state completely vanished as a people. Albania survived as a people without assimilation under Turkish rule for 500 years because the Turkish conquerors found them as a foreign national state. Albania's resistance, initiated and gloriously sustained by Skanderbeg for a quarter of a century, and then continued up to the eve of Mehmed the Conqueror's death, disrupted his ambitious plans and ensured that Italy and possibly other lands of Western Europe were not called upon to share in her fate. One man's destiny became a nation's epic struggle for freedom. Glory has a terrible price. I think the British very much like the idea of one man standing up against an enemy far greater than himself and sometimes even achieving victory. There's something Churchillian about Skanderbeg and that appeals very much to a wider public. And it is clear, of course, that in the 16th century he was added very quickly to this galaxy of great heroes through history who had done something like that, who had achieved victories against the odds tapped into uh, this sense of identity, this sense of uh, something special, something worth fighting for, and to keep this going for 25 years or so. That, to me, is, is his greatness. And the greatness isn't just in the leadership, but it's in the ability to recognize what can be done and um, the determination um, to carry it through. But my feeling is if you had had a commander who held off the largest empire in the area for 25 years, in some ways you wouldn't really be conquered. They may have come in, but I would say the Albanians had seen 
the weakness of the Ottomans or they'd seen their own strength. I think when you stand up against a people, even if in the end you don't win, um, you have a stronger sense of yourself. And I think Skanderbeg certainly gave the Albanians that. What is so impressive is um, so the personal strength, uh, Skanderbeg's personal strength. He must have an extremely strong character and he must have been very convinced of his mission. Otherwise, he would not have uh, survived all these setbacks. To know Skanderbeg up close is to know the Albanian people. Skanderbeg is the personification of the most just and the most authentic of all Albanian people throughout the centuries. Not just during the period of the 15th century, but the time before, during his life, and even up until today. In all the years I've studied Skanderbeg, uh, he's still pretty enigmatic. Uh, I'm impressed. Uh, his mind is military genius, his uh, fortitude. However, it's his last few days uh, of life on this earth that impresses me the most. Skanderbeg, the person, the man. He could have stayed in Italy in 1467 when he went to get help from the Pope and Ferrante. He knew the war was over. There was no way coming from the West. The Ottomans were on the verge of total annihilation of his people, total devastation of the land. Yet, he didn't stay in Italy. He could have. They begged him to stay. But he decided to go back to Albania. Go back to his people, to his warriors, to his family. He goes back to Lier, oddly enough. A place 25 years earlier when he forged the national covenant between him and the Albanians. Why does he go there? He goes there because, also, he has to prepare his people. He knew he was dying, some say, some historians actually, that uh, when he was in Italy. So he had to go back. And he had to prepare his people for what was coming. And he knew what was coming. So, in a borrowed bed, this man who could have been, who knows, emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire, king of Albania, the Epirus, and the Macedonia, a uh, famed commander who expelled the Turks from Europe, was now in a borrowed bed, a sick old man trying to save his people. In his final days, he was thinking about his people in his final moment and in his final breath. Tani, o bosch luftetar, forte dashur. Ja po jule. Prandai, ju lutem te zhitve. Ve ju kerkoi ce ket besni kri. Ket mir si le dashuri, ce sukon betur kurun ga ana ime. Takini me ta tregoni, me deshir tuoi, kundrejt biritim, kundrejt zonitim, ce un do t'ja dorzoi, me do t'ja lë si ftyr le pasyr tim, Sime kambes në vendin tim. Këto janë o drita ime, o biri im, por osit lëmsimet që unë vetë këm marë e këm surë nga prindi im. Lënë nga këto mësime këm betur zhithmoni knasur. Me këta e kom arsyr vetën. Me këta e kom mësuar. Këta i pata si model për moshën dhe tërë jetën time. Prej këtyre me në fun kom pasur përfitime shumë të mohë. Pra ndaj të këshiloj me të malë. Të lutëm si prinë. Si print lutëm me të lëshoj be që ti mësë shëleti, që ti përca foshë, ti këthithësh, ti ruash. Gjerqë, qo se po në vinë Turqit, qo Gjerqë? Dilni, dilni u shtarë këmë dë armisë me dhe barbarëve, shkoni për para meje, se po vijun me një herë nga pasë. O, 
Kristë, he o zotë madhë, kush është të që fësuar e i lartë, asë trim e i fortë, që të mos të dhëmi vogel, i dopë e i pa fusishëm, që të mund të shpetoj vdekjes. Yeah. Mm-hmm.